approximately 10 a.m., Cleveland Hopkins Airport was evacuated amidst rumors that a hijacked plane was going to land. Passengers had to leave, but couldn't drive. They had to walk or hitchhike. Buses weren't allowed to leave. People were sent home. According to Associated Press and local Ohio papers, one plane landed at approximately 1045. But Delta Airlines confirmed that their plane, Delta 1989, landed in Cleveland at 1010. Therefore, Flight 93 landed at Cleveland at approximately 1045. Authorities searched Delta 1989 for over two hours, and passengers were questioned individually. The plane dealer reported that the plane was evacuated at 1230, but the Akron Beacon reports that a plane was evacuated at 1115, which would make that Flight 93. Mayor White reported that the plane had 200 passengers, but a passenger from Delta 1989 described 60 or so passengers. So at 1115, 200 or so passengers were released from Flight 93. The passenger from Delta 1989 states that she was taken into FAA headquarters. But other reports say that passengers were brought into the NASA Glenn Research Center, located near the west end of the airport, which had already been evacuated. So, to sum up, Delta 1989 landed at 1010, was evacuated at 1230, almost two and a half hours later, and 69 passengers were taken to FAA headquarters. Flight 93 landed at 10.45 and evacuated within a half hour. 200 or so passengers quickly taken to an empty NASA research center. Why did it take 140 minutes to evacuate 69 passengers when 200 were evacuated in a half hour? We can assume that the passengers from Delta 1989 are safe somewhere. The question remains, what happened to the 200 or so passengers from Flight 93? It's interesting to note that the combined total of all the passengers from all four flights is 198, or 243, depending on who you ask. We may never know what really happened to Flight 93, but we do know what didn't happen. Whenever this evidence is presented to people, you'll usually get one of many different questions. The first one being, if different planes were used, what happened to the original ones? Unfortunately, we may never know what really happened. But if we could examine the black boxes from the planes that were used, we could prove that they weren't the original flights. A commercial plane carries two different black boxes. Each black box carries one of two different recorders a cockpit voice recorder, and a flight data recorder. The cockpit voice recorder records sounds from inside the cockpit, including engine noise, stall warnings, and other sounds of interest. Communications between air traffic control, weather briefings, and conversations between pilots and crew are also recorded. The flight data recorder records at least 28 different parameters, such as time, altitude, speed, and heading. Some also record more than 300 other in-flight characteristics, anything from autopilot to smoke alarms. The recorders themselves are made from the most impervious metals known to man, and the information is recorded along with date and time, and spooled into a continuous roll. Any damage that is done to the roll is done to the outside, as opposed to the inside where the data is. The 9-11 Commission says that CVRs and FDRs from American 11 and United 175 were not found. Yet, the FBI claims to have found the passport of Satam al sakami which managed to fly out of his pocket, through the explosion, and onto the streets of Manhattan below. So, four different black boxes, made from the most resilient materials known to man, were destroyed. Yet, a passport, made from a fragile material known as paper, managed to survive? Who writes this stuff? Ted Lepatkowitz, spokesman for the National Transportation Safety Board, told CBS News that it's extremely rare that we don't get the recorders back. I can't recall another domestic case in which we did not recover the recorders. 
Turns out Ted's right. Nicholas DeMassey, a firefighter who helped the recovery efforts, claims in the book, Behind the Scenes, Ground Zero. At one point, I was assigned to take federal agents around the site to search for the black boxes from the planes. There were a total of four black boxes. We found three. I guess it all comes down to who you'd rather believe. FBI Director Robert Mueller said Flight 77's data recorder provided altitude, speed, headings, and other information, but the voice recorder contained nothing useful. And Donald Rumsfeld said the data on the cockpit voice recorder was unrecoverable. As for Flight 93, it was the only flight where the cockpit voice recorder was recovered. It was played for the families in April 2002, but not before they signed an agreement saying that they wouldn't talk about it. They couldn't even take notes. And for some reason, the last three minutes of the tape was unaccounted for. The FBI had no explanation for the discrepancy. Why would the 9-11 Commission tell us Flight 11 and 175's recorders weren't found? Why would Robert Mueller tell us that there's nothing interesting on Flight 77's? What's on the last three minutes of Flight 93's cockpit voice recorder? These are vital questions that need to be answered. It's an interesting postscript that Flight 93 was spotted on April 10, 2003 at Chicago's O'Hare Airport by David Friedman, a United Airlines employee who records all of his flights. The tail number, N591UA, was spotted on Flight 1111, a United Airlines 757. And according to the FAA, both N591UA and N612UA, Flights 93 and 175, are still valid but flights 11 and 77 are listed as destroyed. Not to mention that they were not even scheduled to fly on September 11th. Next, what about the cell phone calls? For starters, the calls themselves are extremely peculiar. Most of them are only a couple sentences long before the callers end the conversation, only to call back later. Flight attendant Betty Ong allegedly placed a call from Flight 11. According to the 9-11 Commission, although the conversation lasted 23 minutes, only four and a half minutes was recorded. What is your name? Okay, my name is Betty Ong. I'm number three on Flight 11. Okay. And the cockpit is not answering their phone. And there's somebody staffed in business class, and there's, we can't breathe in business class. Somebody's got mace or something. Okay. Our, our number one is, got stabbed. Uh, our person is stabbed. Um, nobody knows who stabbed who, and we, we can't even get up to business class right now because nobody can breathe. Uh, our number one is, is stabbed right now. Okay. Uh, and uh, and our have... number five, our first class passengers, our uh, first class uh, galley flight attendant, and our purser has been stabbed. And we can't get up to the cockpit. The door won't open. Does Miss Ong sound like a woman on a hijacked plane who just saw three people murdered? Why is nobody in the background screaming? Flight attendant Madeline Sweeney allegedly talked with her ground manager Michael Woodward for 25 minutes. She describes four hijackers. The FBI says there were five. She says the hijackers were in rows 9 and 10. The FAA says they were all in row 8. Near the end, she screams, I see buildings. Water. Oh my god. Madeline was a flight attendant out of Boston for 12 years. I think she would have recognized Manhattan. A man claiming to be Mark Bingham called his mother Alice, who is visiting his sister-in-law. The caller says, Mom, this is Mark Bingham. When was the last time you called your mother and used your full name? I just want to tell you that I love you. I'm on a flight from Newark to San Francisco, and there are three guys on board, and they say they've taken over the plane, and they say they have a bomb. I'm calling you from the airphone. And then, you believe me, don't you, Mom? Yes, Mark, I believe you. Who are these guys? Then he was interrupted by someone who was speaking in a low-toned male voice, speaking what sounded like English. After 30 seconds of muffled sounds, the caller repeats, I'm calling you with an airphone. His mother asks him again, Who are these guys? After another pause, he returns and asks again, You believe me, don't you, Mom? There was another pause, and the phone just trailed off. To date, none of these calls, except for Betty Ong's call to American Airlines, has been released to the public. But to be honest, none of that matters. Why? Because none of these calls could have taken place. Key Dudney of Physics911.net conducted some research of his own. In an experiment called Project Achilles, he took a series of cell phones onto a Cessna 172 and flew up to 8,000 feet to determine the success rate as the plane got higher. At 4,000 feet, 